Brethren, I have a question for you today to start out. Can you do hard things? Can you do hard things? Do you do hard things? Do you face challenges well? Do you, do we all, have a certain level of self-mastery to demand things of ourselves that aren't always easy or aren't always pleasant? Now, I know at first blush, this may sound as exciting as taking cod liver oil, uh, you know, doing hard things. If any of you have ever had cod liver oil, you know what I mean. Um, not very pleasant, even though it's good for us, right? Or like the uh, question I think that was asked in a recent article, uh, do you like correction? Well, of course not. You know, who, who would like correction? And yet, it's good for us. I think the same thing goes for doing hard things in life. By definition, hard things are hard to do, right? I know that's fairly simple. Um, but there's a level of discomfort in doing hard things. I'd like to talk about this today because as we go along, I think we'll find there are some things in our personal life and also spiritually having to do with being willing, being able to have self-control, self-discipline, self-mastery to do hard things. Can you do hard things? If you haven't guessed yet, my title is Do Hard Things. Let's turn over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 1. We find a statement where Paul told Timothy, if you're going to be a Christian, there are going to be things that are hard, that are difficult. He said in verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And you, therefore, verse 3, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul said, Timothy, if you're going to be a soldier of Jesus Christ, some things are going to demand discipline, self-mastery. You might have to dig deeper than you ever have before. You might have to get out of your comfort zone. All these ways of saying it that we have in our world today. Uh, maybe you won't have all your material wants. You know, Paul was hungry at times. He was persecuted at times. He was stressed because of the care of the churches, because of the leadership roles he had. But he said, Timothy, stiffen your spine you will have to do difficult things. What about us, brethren? Are we facing and can we face hardship as a good soldier of Christ? As Timothy was told to do. You know, soldiers are trained to focus on a mission. Mr. Hart was talking a little bit about uh, soldiers and, and warfare. Um, and, and endure difficult circumstances. You know, on this recent trip that I just got back from, at one point I was talking to a gentleman who uh, was uh, relating some of the, uh, he was mentioning some of the training that the special forces and some of our uh, soldiers in this country go through today to even sleep standing up when it's not conducive or safe to uh, to actually camp, to actually set up their camp. They sleep standing up against each other in a, in a group. And, you know, try that sometime. I mean, think how comfortable would that be? And yet for them, sometimes, it, it's necessary to accomplish the mission. Brethren, can we do hard things? First Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. Notice. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 
17. Peter said, For it is time for judgment to be begin. I'm reading from the NIV this time. With the family of God, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? You know, the King James and the, I believe the New King James says, if the righteous is scarcely saved. I think the NIV in this case perhaps um, gives a better sense of it. It's not like we're, we're barely saved. It's not like God is, uh, you know, once we're saved, he just wipes his brow. Whew, you know, I'm, I'm really glad I was able to save them. I don't think that's a problem for him. It seems that it's more that it is hard, that there are things that are difficult for us that we're going to have to go through in order to be saved. There are things that we will have to put up with, difficulties, hardship. Not impossible. Not impossible because we are more than conquerors, right? But hard. Can we do hard things? Notice in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. Here's an example of Jesus talking to a, a young man who was contemplating following him, thinking about being a, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 it says, And behold, uh, one came to him and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the young man was feeling pretty good at this point. He was saying, yeah, I, I can check that one off. I can check that one off. You know, I'm, get, I'm, I'm batting 100 so far here, or 1,000. So the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, maybe those were the easy parts, right? Maybe those were the things that were not difficult for him. He said, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, if you really want to make it, if you want to go all the way, do what's difficult. Go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, why did Jesus tell him this? He probably knew this was the difficulty for the young man, right? Was he just tripping him up? Was he just thinking, aha, I've got you. I've, I've got the one thing you can't do. So this will hold you back from filling, fulfilling your potential. Obviously not. He doesn't do it that way. I think more Jesus Christ understood that if this was an area of difficulty for him, sooner or later this man would have to pass the test. And so he was bringing it to him squarely in the face, saying, look, this is what's required. He couldn't face it. Why do we have trials? Why does God bring us squarely face to face with the things that are difficult for us? Because he hates us or because he loves us? And he wants to give us the opportunity to grow and learn and overcome the difficult things. So we can make it. So we can be there. So we can be happier now. So we can expand our capacity. So we can fulfill our potential. He wants us to grow. Verse 22. But when the young man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Brethren, are there hard things that we must do? By comparison, 
Just about every single one of us is rich. A rich man or a woman, by comparison to them back then, by comparison to most of the population of the earth today, he's saying it's hard for a rich man, a man or woman with possessions, to enter the kingdom. Now, did he say that to discourage us, to, to make us lose heart? No. He said, again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished. They said, well, we might as well throw up our hands, right? Who can then be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible but with God, all things are possible. Whatever is the hard thing for us, God says, I can help you. I can help you. But we have to be willing to do the hard thing. Brethren, can we do hard things? You know, God is a master at doing hard things, wouldn't you say? Um, let, let's take something small like creating the universe. Uh, okay, he created the, the sun, the planets, uh, the solar system, the galaxies, the universe. How many of us can do that? That's pretty hard, right? He's pretty good at doing hard things. He created human beings. He created the creation on earth. Pretty complex, pretty difficult. He dwells with us. He puts up with us. That's kind of hard, isn't it? He wants to have a relationship with us. He sent his son to this earth. That was kind of hard, don't you think? For him and for his son. Why? Because we needed it. We needed a Savior. Brethren, if God will, is willing to do any hard thing for us so that we can be in his family, are we willing to do the hard things? Or do we shrink back? Now, I'm not talking about doing risky things, you know, uh, doing dangerous things frivolously. I hope you understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> I'm talking about doing the right things, doing good things that might tax us a little beyond our current capacity but are needful and we grow and we develop and we become more capable as we do the hard things you know some of us just got back from the uh, living youth camp canoe trip up in Voyager uh, National Park up in uh, Minnesota wonderful trip it really turned out well up in the beautiful boundary waters of northern Minnesota we had 43 campers uh, who enjoyed, well, it's, did they enjoy it? Let me think. Uh, who endured, yeah, they enjoyed it, a, a rugged canoeing experience, paddling a, a six-day uh, trip, 50-mile course through really world-famous canoeing country. People from all over the world come up there. It brought back a lot of memories for those of us who had been at SCP and really had, had traced some of the same routes at that time. Uh, but a great experience for the, for the teens and the staff just completed it uh, about a, a week or so ago. We had 17 canoes loaded down with, as I mentioned, uh, 43 campers and around 27 staff members. All the food we'd need for six days of survival. Yeah, it wasn't survival training, don't get me wrong. You know, our tents, our sleeping bags, our personal items, our life jackets, our paddles, a huge logistical uh, task for, for Mr. Weston and, and the crew who put it together. Um, two teams of canoes started at each end of the route, one in uh, Crane Lake on the eastern edge, the other in Cabotagama Lake on the western edge. We started, we, we crisscrossed, and then ended up on the other, other side. We left on a Sunday morning, we returned on Friday. And I think everybody agreed that it was just about the best Sabbath rest we had ever had. You know, it was a wonderful Sabbath rest, just fantastic. Um, 
But you know, the day we left, it was beautiful, sunshiny, white, puffy clouds, about 72 degrees, a gentle breeze blowing across Crane Lake, and uh, just a wonderful day, just a great start to a six-day canoe trip, right? Well, it wasn't long before the next day. See, that was just a decoy. Uh, the next day, the, the clouds rumbled in, the, the thunderstorm started, and uh, we battled intermittent thunderstorms the rest of the way. But you know, the teens took the challenge. They really took the challenge. Many of them had never done anything like this before. Uh, if they had canoed, they had uh, not done it to this, this degree or this long. Uh, it was out of their comfort zone. It was a remote place. Uh, it demanded more patience. It did, that tested their skills, demanded more endurance and teamwork. And you know, th the thing that really struck me is, as expected, the adversity. It actually was good that we had some thunderstorms, and we had some cool weather, and we had some lightning. We got off the lake when the lightning came. We were safe. We, had, we took pre precautions. We, we had preparations that minimized the risk. But it was uncomfortable enough, and there was enough adversity that you could see the teams bonding as the days went by, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, you could see people working together. You could see people chipping in. You could see, by and large, the attitudes were great, very, no complaining, really, really helping one another because of the adversity. You know, I, I don't think that that trip would have been as memorable and as enjoyable if it had been 72 degrees, white puffy clouds, gentle breeze blowing from the west every single day. Now, you can ask some of those who are on the trip. Maybe they will say something different. Um, but it really challenged them. It tests them. It pushed them. And, you know, we on the staff were really proud of how, how well they did. Some of them were nervous about it, going into it. You know, what to expect? I've never done this before. Um... But it was, it was very good for them. But it was uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable at times. You know, after a few days of not being comfortable, your priorities change. No longer is it, where is my cell phone and my iPod? Uh, it's more, I would just love to have a warm, dry bed. I would love to have a warm shower. I'd love to have something other than dehydrated eggs, you know, uh, for breakfast, whatever, home-cooked meal. The beautiful thing was they rose to the challenge. Brethren, adversity can do that for us. Hard things can do that for us. Why did we take 43 campers all the way to northern Minnesota? To make them miserable for six days? To get them as wet as possible and, and, you know, and have their tents wet and, and the mosquitoes just biting them like crazy? Was it to make them miserable? Of course not. Some might feel that way. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it was to present an obstacle, something that was hard, something that was challenging, and to see and help them to understand and, and, and experience that dynamic of what happens when we face difficult things and how sweet the success is when we come out the other end and we've grown from it. You know, Proverbs 13, 19 says, A desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it's an abomination to fools to depart from evil. It's a biblical concept. There's something very satisfying about accomplishing difficult goals. Have you ever noticed that? You know, when you set low goals... They're not very challenging. They're, they're fairly easy to uh, achieve. Let's say like uh, getting up in the morning. Okay, well, getting up in the morning, fairly low goal, right? <clears throat> now, getting up at 5.30 might be a little bit higher of a goal. But you ever see and experience how setting low goals may be kind of more comfortable, but it's not as rewarding? We have to set high goals for them to be rewarding and them to be sweet to the soul. 
You know, doing hard things is becoming a lost art in our culture, and especially for our young people. There is a, uh, a growing tendency in our culture today. We don't want to set expectations high for young people. After all, you're, you're just a kid. You don't need to challenge yourself. Take it easy. The teenage years are playtime. They're kind of throwaway years. But there, there are people out in the world who are contesting that view. One of them is a group of writers, teenage writers, actually. I believe they're 19 at the, at the present named Alex and Brett Harris. And they wrote a book several years ago. This one, I think, is copyrighted 2008. Uh, but originally, it was started uh, several years ago. It's called Do Hard Things. You see, I'm not very original on my title. I kind of stole it from them. But they, they talk about there's a problem today. And that is that there's a cultural paradigm today that many young people are not being encouraged and, and, and challenged to do difficult things in the preparation time in their life. Let me read a little bit from the inside cover. It says, a growing movement of young people is rebelling against the low expectations of today's culture by choosing to do hard things for the glory of God. Do hard things is Alex and Brett Harris's revolutionary message in its purest and most compelling form giving readers a tangible glimpse of what is possible for teens who actively resist cultural lies that limit their potential. Combating the idea of adolescence as a vacation from responsibility, the authors weave together biblical insights, history, and modern examples to redefine the teen years as the launching pad of life. Interesting. Instead of, I think they put it so well, instead of the teen years being a, a vacation from responsibility, it's the launching pad of life. It's the time to prepare for adulthood. And these gentlemen are saying that our culture does not encourage that today. And something's wrong. Going on, they say, uh, quoting from the book, America in so many words. In the first part of the 20th century, we, we made a startling discovery. There were teenagers among us. Until then, we had thought of people in just two stages, children and adults. And while childhood might have its tender moments, the goal of the child was to grow up as promptly as possible in order to enjoy the opportunities and shoulder the responsibilities of an adult. The girl became the woman. The boy became the man. It was as simple and significant is that. In earlier times, a person reaching adult size at age 13 or 14 was ready to do adult work. Now adult size was achieved as soon as ever, but preparation for adult responsibilities lasted until age 18 or later. Thus, the years ending in dash teen became something new and distinctive. The teenager remade our world. Interesting. Think, think about this. The concept is subversive. Why should any teenager enjoying freedom submit to the authority of adults? With the discovery of this new age, ours has been the century of the teenager ever since. Interesting. These are not people in the church saying this. These are outsiders saying there's something wrong with our culture and what we're telling young people. Now, please understand, we're not saying, I'm not saying that all teens are this way. We have many who are uh, working very hard in, in, in planning and diligent, preparing for their future. But the point is, there's an unspoken, unspoken message in our culture, and it can even have an effect on us in the church. Let's turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. In verse 9, our young people need to be inspired to, to do things, to prepare to get ready for adulthood, to, to take the challenge, to not waste their time. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9, it says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart. 
and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Now think about what he was saying. He's saying that the, the teenage years are not throwaway years. They're not time to just take it easy, just kind of kick back, just kind of tread water, just kind of do, do whatever. Wait till adulthood to get serious about life. Yes, they are time to have fun. Yes, they are time to do the things that please you as a, as a, as a young person. But they're also time to think ahead. And think what kind of consequences are going to come because of our, our actions in our teens. They're time for making hard choices. They're time for making difficult decisions and beginning to build character. They're time for standing up for the Sabbath. They're time for, for beginning to have the strength of character that we are going to need in later life. There are time for studies, you know, taking difficult classes. You know, I remember in, in, when I was in school, there were, there were some students that try to get by on the least. They take the easiest classes. Well, what's the point? It's education. We, we want to be challenged. We hope our young people will, will, will take difficult classes, will we'll, uh, try to learn all they can. Parents, are we inspiring our teens to look at their life this way? Are we challenging our teens to want to, to, to be excited about life and, and challenge themselves with difficult goals even, to set goals? That's the time to do it. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 11. Let's turn over there very quickly. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 11. Are we encouraging our young people to take responsibility at the level that they are, that is appropriate? But are we encouraging that? Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 11. It says, Even a child is known by his deeds whether what he does is pure and right. You know, sometimes even in the church we can, we can sometimes muddy the waters on this. And since children are baptized, we can get into thinking that they have a different standard. But where does it say that God's laws are not applicable to children as well as adults? They're the same, aren't they? Yes, they need to be taught. Yes, they make mistakes. But we need to, we need to not lower their expectations. We need to challenge them to meet high ones. Now, why is this so important? Well, as these teenage authors pointed out, Teenage apathy leads to young adult apathy as well. <clears throat> you know, think about how many sitcoms there are out there that show 20-somethings or 30-somethings or 40-somethings, young adults with no direction, no purpose, just kind of hanging out. That's a very subtle but very significant cultural shift that has taken place in our society. Reading again from Do Hard Things, it says this. In 2005, Time Magazine ran a story on kidults. There's a new, new term called kidults. Not ad adults, not kids, but kidults. A new breed of adolescents in their mid to late 20s and beyond who offer convincing evidence that the modern concept of adolescence is not a biological stage, but a cultural mindset. It doesn't stop when you graduate from high school or when you turn 21. Kidults generally have neither clear direction nor a sense of urgency. Legally, they're adults, but they're on the threshold, the doorway to adulthood, and they're not going through it, says Terry Apter, psychologist at the University of Cambridge. In other words, they're standing on the end of the diving board, but they won't jump in. This is our culture today, brethren. This is what's happening. And it's not just in America. Countries around the world have developed names for young adults like this. They're called kippers in England, uh, nest hawkers in Germany, mammons in France. Sorry for the pronunciation. I know it's not right. 
and freeders in Japan. They say this isn't just a trend, a temporary fad, or a generational hiccup, the article warns. This is a much larger phenomenon of a different kind in a different order. Now, why is this important? Brethren, because we are living in this age. We are right in the middle of this age. And we love our young people. And our young people are the future. And we want them to learn to take responsibility and be ready for adulthood. We want them to be prepared, to be strong pillars. We want them to be ready for the burdens of life and reap the blessings. Do we see how damaging this cultural shift is to the future, to our society and even to the church? First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. Let's turn over there for a moment. Are we encouraging our young people to do hard things? To take challenges? That's the point. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. It says, These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and conduct, in love and in spirit, in faith and in purity. Paul was encouraging Timothy, you know, don't despise your youth. Do your job. Uh, fulfill your responsibility. But, you know, we can look at this another way. That on the one hand, our culture idolizes youth, perpetual youth, but on the other hand, they despise youth. That it's, 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 it's a throwaway time. It's not any time that is preparing. So we need to encourage our teens to not take their time for granted, but prepare for, for big things ahead. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. And I'd, I'd like to encourage our our young people here and any who might uh, see this down the road, take your time seriously and, and, and use your, your youth, your teenage time as a launching pad for preparing for exciting things in adulthood. Tremendous opportunities and the blessings that will come if we do that. Notice Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. You know, the more we take opportunities, the more we take advantage of opportunities, even little opportunities to do hard things. They grow into big opportunities. Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having re received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. Now, our young people, if they will take the opportunities that are given to them in small ways, those small steps, even as a child, even as a teenager, those small steps turn into big opportunities in the future, especially when we look off into, you know, what's going to happen in the millennium and beyond. An amazing principle. If we will do the, 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 the small, little, hard steps now, God will increase our capacity. And our young people need to, need to know this. You know, it may be taking the hard classes, like I was talking about before. It may be taking LU classes, some Bible classes. Um, it may be learning a language. Yeah, that's, that's a hard thing. I've... I've studied language uh, before, and it's, it's, it's difficult. It really pushes you out of your comfort zone. 
great thing to do while we're young. Uh, volunteering to help at church, uh, to help in different ways. And then when we volunteer, to be on time every time. You know, that's a, that's a small step for a young person. That's a hard thing to do. And yet, this says the more we do the little hard things well, the more they will turn into big opportunities. We have an off, awesome uh, future ahead of us. <clears throat> but, you know, the challenge is not just for our teens. Are hard things just hard for young people? Or do all of us have to fight against apathy and just always taking the easy way out? Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 3. I've talked about young people for some time now, but let's expand this a little bit because it's really not just about them. It's really not just their issue. It's all of us. Notice in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, a familiar scripture. It says, To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, when we understand what this is talking about, it, it's... It's saying the last era of the church would be characterized by lukewarm complacency. But why is that? Where does that complacency come from? Well, read on, verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Brethren, why is this a problem in the last era for the church? Well, because it's a problem in the whole of society. There is a complacency in all of society. Don't try too hard. Don't demand too much of yourself. You don't have to curb your appetites. Uh, just do what feels good. You, you, you don't need to think about self-restraint and self-discipline and self-control. Isn't it true that even those, those words, they, count, they kind of sound like they come from the 1800s, you know? They don't really fit in, in our day and age. Self-control, self-discipline, self-restraint. You know, a few years ago, there was the Sprite commercial, Obey Your Thirst. Doesn't that just about sum up our culture today, our society? Obey your appetites. Don't curb them. Don't do what's hard. You don't need to discipline yourself. Now, brethren, the danger is not just for our young people, but it's for us. And perhaps one of the biggest dangers of our time is the complacency the apathy, the drifting away from doing the hard things. Again, can we do hard things? You know, Laodicean era is defined as an era of easy things. Life is not too bad. Sure, I have to go to work, but I have a job. I've got enough. I've got all the things I need. I've got many of the things I want. I'm full. I'm not missing a meal. Other ages weren't like this. Brethren, in a time of apathy and complacency, are we still holding on to and are we having a fervency of doing the difficult things? That's the point. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 32, and verse 9. There are warnings that were for ancient Israel about hard times coming on a complacent people. People who had it pretty comfortable, pretty, pretty easy, and it's very fitting for today as well. Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 9. It says, Rise up, you women who are at ease, who are comfortable. Um, 
there's nothing hard about life. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a year and some days you'll be troubled, you complacent women, for the vintage will fail. The gathering will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Yeah, as you read this, doesn't this paint a picture of our day? Of a people who are at ease, who are complacent, who are not used to the burdens and the difficult things that even a few generations ago had. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves, make yourselves bare, and gird sackcloth on your waist. People shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. On the land of my people will come up thorns and briars. Yes, on all the happy homes in the joyous city, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted. The forts and towers will become lairs forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. He's saying hard times are coming. Back then. And we know yet in, in, in our future. The, th the way things are around us is not going to stay that way. Hard times are coming. Are we lulled into a complacent sleep? Or are we ready? Are we willing to do the hard things now? Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 1. This is a prophecy of our time. He said, But know this, Paul wrote, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. That sounds like, you know, not those who are willing to self discipline the self and, and control the self. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And how could you, again, sum it up better than to describe our society today? Brethren, the point is that we are products of this society. So are we willing to make the hard choices, do the hard things in a society that is drifting more to apathy and complacency? Because that's the challenge for those of us who are living in this day and age. Do we face them squarely or do we avoid challenges? Well, let's talk about some specifics as we try to narrow this down. You know, when you think about what are the hard things that we have to do, I think we could come up with an endless list. Um, we all have different things that are hard for us. Some things that are hard for me may not be for you and vice versa. Um, but here are a few I thought of, and, and perhaps you can think of others. What are some hard things that for Christians in the Laodicean era? To focus on. Well, number one, number one, be willing to make commitments. Be willing to make commitments. Wouldn't you say that commitments are hard? Um, you know, when you commit to one thing, it means you're cutting out some other things. Sometimes it's a hard skill. But to reap the benefits of life, we have to make some commitments, don't we? We've got to. Uh, make commitments, whether it's educational or financial or uh, marriage or, or children. I remember uh, Dr. Laura, didn't she say once, if you don't want to raise your children, don't have them? Didn't she say that one time? You know, it, it's a commitment once you have children to, to raise them, right? You can't decide not to after that point. And when we make that commitment, we see the joys and we experience the, the wonderful benefits of, of those things in life. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Perhaps the greatest commitment that we are required to make. Jesus Christ explained it here. And it's a very difficult one. It's a challenge. Many of us have made it. But look at it. Luke chapter 14 and verse Verse uh, 25. 
He said, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, have you thought this was kind of a down sermon up till now? How about what Jesus Christ just said? He said, if you're not willing to give up everything, you're not qualified to be my disciple. Did Jesus Christ say hard things were required for his disciples? He didn't sugarcoat it. He said, if you want to live forever, if you want salvation, you have to be willing to give it all up. And you know, the amazing thing is with God's help, he helps us to see how we do it, how we see the benefits. And, and it's him who helps us to make those commitments. But we have to make that commitment. You know, those of us in this room who are baptized, we came to this juncture in our life and we made that commitment. Notice in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. What enables us to make such a difficult commitment? Well, we see the benefits. We see what comes if we are willing to follow Christ, right? Look what Paul said. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, and righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. Isn't it interesting that as we make the little hard decisions along the way, that we see the vision ever brighter. That Paul was able to say as he was living his life, you know, he began to see that all the things I gave up really didn't amount to anything. All those things that Jesus Christ said you have to be willing to give up, the more Paul walked this way of life, the more he saw the vision, the more he saw the end point, the easier it was to let those go. And isn't that true for us? As we make this commitment, as we follow through on this commitment, as we make the hard choices, it actually gets easier. We can see the goal. You know, some of us are just on the threshold of that commitment, whether here or in others who may see this later. Not really sure if we can make it. Not really sure if we, we can make that kind of commitment to Jesus Christ. You know, if we're in that category, we need to ask God for help. We need to ask him to, to, to help us through that door, help us to see that it's for our own good, it's for our benefit. We're really not giving that much up when we give over our life to God. And then we just need to, to take that step, asking God to, to help us and back us up. Commitment can be daunting, but it starts with one step at a time. Number two, number two, another hard thing for us today that we must do is get on a training program. Get on a training program. You know, you can commit to being on a track team, but that doesn't really get you in shape, does it? Any of you, uh, you know, you join the track team and you sit up in the stands every practice? Well, the coach wouldn't like that, right? It wouldn't work. We wouldn't get in shape. Do we think of our life as training or, or, let's say, coasting. You know, coasting is really nice. We tried to do that a few times on the canoe trip. When we had a nice uh, wind at our back, we'd put up a poncho or a, a tarp or something. But yeah, it, it never really works, and it, uh, it always shifts, and then it's right in your, in your face again. 
Um, isn't our life like that too? Coasting doesn't really work. I remember when we were in school and it was uh, basketball season or track season or baseball season, uh, because we were, we were practicing, we were running, we were trying to stay in shape, we'd really watch what we were eating. We'd really watch, you know, we got enough sleep and, and that we were uh, staying healthy. Because um, you know if you overindulge at this meal today, you're going to pay for it at practice tomorrow, right? You're going to feel awful. You're just going to feel terrible. But it was amazing once the season was over, once that impetus, once that urgency to stay in shape, it's amazing how quickly we got out of shape. You know, the ice cream, the cookies, all these wonderful things started looking really nice. Brethren, do we see our lives as a training ground for the kingdom? Do we see it as something that, that, that we have to have a sense of self-discipline? Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. To reap the benefits, to enjoy the blessings, not only do we need to make commitments, but we also need to be in training. We need to have a program. We need to have a personal trainer. You know, the word self-discipline is kind of interesting. It has a bad connotation. It just sounds really bad, doesn't it? Self-discipline. It, it, it sounds like it's res restrictive, right? <clears throat> but what does it really mean? Discipline just means teaching. It means self-teaching. It means being our own personal trainer. Do we have self-discipline? Are we on a training program training ourselves? 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. You know, when we're training, when we're on the court, when we're on the field, you know you have to be temperate. You know you have to be careful. Do we have the same urgency in our life? Or are we just coasting? Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be become disqualified. The NIV says it a little differently. It says, do you know... Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Strict training. Are we in training? Do we see our lives that way? You know, again, it doesn't sound very fun. It sounds like taking cod liver oil again. But you know, the benefits are immense. Are there things that, that, that you would like to ramp up in your personal training? Are there things that you'd like to change? Maybe in the way you handle stress. You know, many of the, the, the ways that uh, we handle stress in, in our life today, in our society today, actually only bring on more stress. Their escapism, you know, watching TV, staying up late, uh, eating in some cases, it doesn't solve the stress, right? Would you like to make some changes in your life in how you handle stress? Some difficult changes, some hard changes. What about eating right? What about eating healthy foods? What about getting enough sleep? What about getting exercises, getting exercise? What changes would you like to make? You know, th these things have, have an impact on our spiritual life. How can we pray meaningfully in the morning if we're kind of groggy and foggy, right? If we're staying up late and we don't feel good. Mr. Ames encouraged us, as was mentioned in the office meeting, to really know our Bibles. You know, are, are we 
Do we see it as a training program that we put ourselves through to take the Bible study course, to really get to know our Bibles? It's sometimes difficult, isn't it? It sometimes is hard. We have to force ourselves. In the morning, you know, it's... We, we have a choice, don't we? When we wake up in the morning, we can either get up and study and pray, or we can roll back over and go to sleep for another 30 minutes, right? What happens in that one moment? There, there's like a nanosecond of time. When we make that choice, we wake up, we, oh, I, I know I should get up and pray and study. Uh, no, I was up a little bit late last night. I'm going to roll over. Next thing you know, we get up. No time to pray and study. Got to get in the shower. Got to get on the road. Guess what happens all day? Everything goes wrong, right? So which is really harder to do? To miss our prayer and study or to take the time to talk to God and get things squared away? And help to make our relationships work that day. And help us to have the right focus that day. And help us to feel self-confident that day. To feel good about ourselves and, and, and what we're accomplishing and, and the vision that we have. Which is really harder? What changes would you like to make? That's the point. Are we willing to do hard things? Even in some of these little things, which really have a huge, huge payback. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse, uh, verse 13. The interesting thing is that these days, these little things we do day by day, the little hard things, you know that waking up in the morning, the getting up instead of the rolling over, it's a hard thing, but it's kind of a little thing, isn't it? But if we do it today, and if we do it the next day, if we do it the next day, guess what? Character is built, habits are formed, our lives are changed. Our capacity for doing bigger things happens and expands. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and and evil. We're in training, but it takes pushing ourselves a little bit, doesn't it? Every day. And every day is like that one push-up. You know, really, to, to, to get strong uh, and to, to develop, uh, you know, strength, it's really not that complicated, is it? You just do one thing, and then you do it over and over and over and over again, right? You do one push-up, and then you do another push-up, and then you do another push-up. The, the one push-up really isn't that difficult. And yet that's the hardest step, isn't it? How much can we do this? Are, are we making the hard choices? Or are, are we just indulging ourselves? Are we just kind of coasting along? Are we in that canoe? You know, we call, we call canoeists that don't really paddle, we call them lily dippers. <clears throat> because they, they, you know, they look like they're paddling, but really they're just kind of dipping their paddle into the water and, you know, kind of watching as the paddle pushes down a little lily pad or something like that. Lily dippers. Are we really paddling in our canoe or are we just kind of letting the paddle drift by, you know? Oh, nice day, nice day. <laughs> wonderful. This is wonderful. It's It's relaxing. Relaxing for that person, but not everybody else in the canoe, right? <clears throat> Are we disciplining our mind? You know, it's other things too, not just uh, in, in prayer or study. What about learning things, taking classes? Um, spokesman club, graduate club, this was mentioned in the uh, announcements, I believe. It's been a fantastic experience to be a part of the spokesman club and graduate club this year we have uh, 28 men who are who are really facing their fears you know speaking in in public is one of the most fearful things for people to do and yet they stand up there every month they go for it 
even though they're evaluated in front of their peers. It's an amazing experience. But they do it. It's a hard task. Are we expanding our horizons? Are we, are we trying new things? Are we doing difficult things? You know, if we're afraid of, of looking silly, if we're afraid of trying new things, we're, we're never going to learn. We're never going to expand our comfort zone. What happens when our comfort zone is right here? What happens when we get out of our comfort zone? We try something new. Well, our comfort zone expands, doesn't it? Then what happens if we expand out of our comfort zone a little bit more? Well, our comfort zone gets bigger. Then what happens if we do something again out of our comfort zone? It gets a little bigger. And then bigger. And eventually, look at all the capacity we have and the experience we have of things that are comfortable. No longer is our comfort zone right here. And all these things out here are, are, are difficult. It's an amazing thing when we do hard things. What happens? Our life actually takes on a zest and a zeal and an excitement that is exciting. What areas of your life would you like to ramp up a bit and do the things that you, you, you've always wanted to do, you know you should do, and really kind of demand of yourself? Only you and only I can answer that. Maybe it's time to take a few steps in that direction. Number three, another difficult thing for Christians today in an era of apathy and complacency is to live a life of love. Live a life of love. Now, I know that sounds like a terrible you know, book on romantic relationships, um, but really, when we understand what, what love is, isn't loving other people really one of the most difficult things that we could strive to attain to in life? To really deeply love other people. And, I, and I'm not just talking about a mate. I'm talking about all people. I'm talking about the 6.9 billion neighbors we have on this earth. Have we taken the challenge to really learn to love other people? Notice in Matthew chapter 7, and verse 12. When you think about it, when you really get down to it, it's a very difficult challenge. It's not a squishy, romantic thing that the world portrays, you know. It's hard, it's difficult, it's a choice. And it demands everything we've got. Matthew chapter 7, and verse Verse 12, Jesus Christ said, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go, by in it, go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus Christ, again, said the way is difficult. And isn't it interesting that just before that he said, love others as you want them to love yourself. Is that by coincidence, or did he, did he mean that that's going to be difficult? To really love other people as we want to be loved? It's a tall order, isn't it? Because we are basically selfish, lazy uh, beings. It doesn't come naturally. It's hard to really respect others when they don't seem to deserve it. At least from our perspective, to really forgive others when they hurt us. Very difficult. To really let go of offenses when they come. Monumental, right? That's the challenge that we, we face. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. Are we living up to that challenge? Are we meeting that challenge? Or do we avoid the challenge? You know, do, do we kind of avoid having to face these types of issues? You know, if we're going to respond the way that God wants us to, Christ wants us to, as we see in Revelation 3, we have to face them squarely. 
and we have to take the challenge. Verse John 4, 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. You know, it's amazing what happens when we do love our brother, when we do forgive one another, when we do look over the faults, not look into, but look over the faults of one another. When we do apologize to one another, don't the bonds get stronger? Don't, doesn't the, the unity grow? Don't we begin to have more respect for one another when we, when we follow this? Very difficult but the rewards are, are amazing. Brethren, what kind of, in, in, in what areas of your life in dealing with others would you like to have a breakthrough in loving others? It's a hard thing, but that's what we're called to, to do. The last one we'll talk about, <clears throat> the last hard thing for Christians today, number four, to change and grow. To change and grow. And grow. You know, one of the hardest things for us to do is to change. But you know, when it comes to our spiritual life, we've got to face that boldly. From time to time, uh, I've heard individuals say when dealing with a particular fault or a problem, well, this is just the way I am. I'm never going to change. This is just me. You might have heard that. You know, brethren, that's chilling to me. That's scary to me. When we get when when any of us get to the point where we say I'm sorry, I cannot change. It's too difficult for me. I will not change. It's too hard. What are we saying? Our growth has stopped at this at that point. You know, if we were a finished product now, what would be the point of living out our life? We're ready for the kingdom. But we have to overcome. And overcoming is hard. Notice in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 29, is there anything that we're facing? Is there anything that you are facing? Think about it in the privacy of your own mind. Is there anything you know you should do you know you should overcome, but it's just too hard. It just seems beyond reach. If that's the case, we just have to take the first step. We have to ask God for help. We have to put our hand in His hand, and we have to go forward, trusting that He will help us to take the second step, because He will. You know, if we are not overcoming, we'll never be happy in this life, and we'll never reach our potential. Overcoming and growing is really one of, the, one of the thrills of life, isn't it? When we can look back and we can see a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago, I was a different person. And I like where I'm, I, I've come compared to that. And I don't want to go back to that one of the greatest joys of life when we take the hard things we grow Matthew chapter 5 and verse 29 it says if your right eye causes you to sin pluck it out cast it from you for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell and if your right hand causes you to sin cut it off cast it from you for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Now, he's not saying really cut off your hand or pluck out your eye. But what he's saying is that to really change or grow or overcome, we've got to make a hard decision. We've got to make a tough decision. We've got to face a, something hard. We've got to take that step, that first step. He's saying there's no time to lose. He'll help us. He'll back us up. But we've got to sh show him that we're committed. 
and take steps that we are really changing. You know, Paul said, he said, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and pressing forward to the things that are ahead, I press toward the goal. Brethren, are, are, are we thinking that way? Can we do hard things? Let's not shortchange ourselves of, of blessings. The mantra of our world today is, you know, just kick back. Don't worry about it. You don't have to change. You don't have to grow. You don't have to discipline yourself. Obey your thirst. Don't do hard things. I mean, that would be uncomfortable. You don't want to be uncomfortable. You know, it's interesting. Even just a few generations ago, uh, travel would have been very different, don't you think? The nicest carriage a hundred years ago wouldn't hold a candle to most of our cars today. I mean, we get in, the seats are nice and soft. We can close the door. We can, we can adjust the air just right. You know, we can even adjust it, you know, sometimes the left person to the right person. And if you're a little cold, you can change it. If you're a little hot, you can change it. We, if we're bored with the person sitting next to us, we can turn on the radio, you know. I mean, everything around us is geared to make us comfortable. And if we're not careful, we start to think that way. And anything uncomfortable is bad. But, you know, if we're going to fulfill our potential, if we're going to be in God's kingdom, if we're going to do the work, we're going to have to do some hard things. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. Mr. Sheldon Munson read this scripture at uh, one of our Bible studies uh, about a week ago up in the, at the camp. And it really struck me. <clears throat> it's in the middle of the story about King Asa, how he started out strong and obedient and loyal, but he turned aside. He stopped doing the hard things. And look at what God told him. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. He said, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God wants to show his power in us. He wants to give us the help to do the hard things that we have to do to take that one step and the next step and the next step ultimately to be in his kingdom. He's there to help us. He's looking for people that, to help. Isn't that amazing? What a tremendous encouragement to think about. He's looking for people whose hearts are fixed on him for people through whom he can work through whom he can show his power he's looking for opportunities to encourage us to help us to do hard things are we taking the challenge are we taking him up on that power we have to make that decision i'd like to read one final scripture in conclusion we did start at two o'clock today right i think so don't want to go half an hour over. My mistake, been out of town a long time. You know. <clears throat> <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32. You and I have incredible opportunities. We all know that. We have tremendous benefits and blessings in this life and in the next we have so many things that God is doing for us and through us. But you know, it takes that one first step, and sometimes it's difficult, it's hard. Are we fixing our hearts on being willing to do that? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32, But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you 
have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, he says, do not cast away your confidence. Don't give up, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, God says, my soul has no pleasure in him. We cannot draw back. We cannot pull back. We can't stop now after coming this far. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Brethren, we've come far, many of us, different distances, different times that we've been walking this way, some less. But we've overcome challenges and obstacles and difficulties. Let's not give up. Let's, let's not throw in the towel. Let's go forward. Let's have boldness. Let's not be afraid of hard things. Because it's through challenges. It's through adversity that God is molding and shaping and refining us and forming us into a beautiful, unified, loving team that he's going to use for all eternity. We have so much to look forward to. Let's do hard things.